Devonte Adams got out of Vegas as the Jets have packed several seasons worth of turmoil into six weeks. NFL owners met in Atlanta and we're speaking with Atlanta Dream co-owner Renee Montgomery. We also have stories from the NFL, MLB, and NBA. It's Wednesday, October 16th. I'm your host, Owen Poindexter, with a scratchy voice today. And this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're discussing the state of the Jets with the athletic Zach Rosenblatt. My colleague Eric Fisher checks in from the NFL owners meeting, and we have a great chat with Renee Montgomery on her journey to becoming a team owner and how that role has changed her perspective. Plus, Jerry Jones threatened the jobs of radio hosts, and the Cleveland Browns kind of admitted defeat on the worst player acquisition in NFL history. First, here are your headlines. The Jets are trading a conditional third-round pick for Devontae Adams after another close loss to the Buffalo Bills on Monday night. Adams, who requested a trade from the Raiders last week, is reunited with his former quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, for the first time since he was traded to Vegas in 2022. Meanwhile, the team allowed holdout linebacker Hassan Reddick a short window to seek a trade. Six games in, the Jets' season has been a mess, but at least they're not complacent. The NCAA might tweak their rules after Oregon, winning by one point with 10 seconds left against Ohio, put a 12th man on the field intentionally taking a penalty while also getting a key defensive stop while time ran off the clock. Oregon held on for the win, and that may be the last time they're able to pull that particular trick. Also in college sports, the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors are moving all their sports to the Mountain West in 2026. The school currently already plays in the conference for football and is a member of the Big West in all of their sports. To soccer, Boston's NWSL team has a name, Boss Nation Football Club, or FC. The club also revealed its logo and team colors, including a classic green and white look that you may recognize from another of Boston's storied teams. Boss Nation will begin NWSL play in 2026 at a renovated stadium in Boston's Roxbury neighborhood. The name's honestly a little weird to me, but I'm trying to reserve judgment until I get used to it. Over to sports media, Tim Keeley, the man who helped make inside the NBA the powerhouse that it is today, is rejoining TNT for what is likely the show's final season as we know it. Keeley, who produced the show from 1995 through the 2023 season, is returning as TNT's executive producer of NBA Studio Production after only a year in retirement. It's presumed that Keeley will help see the show through its transition after TNT loses its NBA media rights in 2025. Tom Brady has finally been approved as an NFL owner after a unanimous vote by the league's owners. He is now in the unique role of being both an owner and a national broadcaster, and the league has placed restrictions on what he can do as a media member in an attempt to avoid conflict of interest issues. We'll have more on this and other stories from the NFL owners' meetings later in the episode. Up next, the Athletic senior writer Zach Rosenblatt joins the show to give us some insight on what the Devontae Adams trade means for the New York Jets and what to expect from this team in the Aaron Rodgers era. I'm joined now by senior writer for The Athletic, Zach Rosenblatt. Welcome, Zach. Thanks. How you doing, man? Great. Great to have you on. Scratchy voice, but getting through it. Um, so busy day in your world. The Jets traded for Devontae Adams. They're all in on the the Aaron Rodgers era. Uh, before we get to kind of the broader picture here, I'm wondering if you think that this team can, in fact, credibly, credibly believe that they are one or two big pieces away from being real contenders here. Based on what we've seen so far, I, I don't think you could say they're one piece away at this point. Like if you would ask me before the season, the Jets trade for Devontae Adams in week six, I would say, okay, then they probably started off really well and he's like the missing piece. But it's actually kind of the opposite. They've been kind of a mess. They've dug themselves into a hole. And now this is kind of like to help pull them out of the hole more than like contend for the Super Bowl at night. You know, they didn't wind up having to give up like a lot, a lot for like a very good player. It is a rental, like financially, it is a lot of money, but, um, you know, it's more like a why not type thing like this. Everybody here is on the hot seat and they're trying to win and make the playoffs and snap the, you know, the skid of 13 years, which is the highest in all four of the sports. So, um, ultimately this is more to like bring them higher up to the out of the hole that they're in than it is like to bring them towards a Super Bowl trophy. And that's it's kind of like the disappointing part of the start of the season, I would say. Uh huh. So we're, we're saying like playoffs are still on the table. You know, it's only week six, but Super Bowl, which, you know, I, th- I think was an aspiration before the season. Not really talking about that right now. I guess it's they're two and four. How can you? But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. They're at a point now where like each every game they play in is um must win. Like it's seems extreme at this point of the season, but you're two and four. They play the Steelers this week. If they fall to two and five, that's a pretty hard hole to climb out of. And there's this is a team with 
holes in some areas that they haven't really had in past years, like on the defensive line, you know, they, they have some issues at safety. They're kind of, they have a pretty good group on offense, but the offensive line has been inconsistent. And, you know, the guys outside of Garrett Wilson have been inconsistent that receiver. And so there's a lot of questions and Aaron Rodgers, like he doesn't look quite like Aaron Rodgers of old. He looks really good at his best at his worst. He looks pretty bad because of his age, I think. So um, there's, I think there are a lot more red flags. Like they could, they could certainly turn it around and I could change my, if you, if you ask me again in a couple of weeks and they've won a couple of games and all that, um, maybe I change my tune, but as, as they they've looked so far and as it stands right now, I, I have a long way to go before I can consider them like a Super Bowl contender and in, in a conference with the Ravens and the chiefs and the Texans and all that stuff. Yeah. You mentioned their defense, that defense would really be helped by Hassan Reddick, who, um, you know, obviously they, they traded for and has been holding out the entire season. Now they're granting him this limited window to seek a trade. Um, yeah, I'm just curious what you make of this whole situation. Like, where where did things go wrong here? Yeah, it's uh, one of the weirder holdouts that's probably ever happened in the NFL. Um, like, I, I can't really imagine there's been a comparable one where a guy got traded to a team um, after, like, basically requesting a trade, went to his intro press conference, and then bailed, basically. And he's forfeited nearly $10 million in a combination of fines and, like, giving up his game week salary so it's just been a wild journey i think it got it's gotten to a point now where it's clear it's more on the player than the jets even though the jets you know they deserve to get a light shine on the fact that they trade for a guy who wanted more money and thought they would be fine not giving him that money when he arrived and clearly he had different plans and you know he went against the advice of his original agent and the agent dropped him and now he's a new agent and now you know before he requested a trade the jets said we're not trading you and now they're like you have 48 hours or whatever to find a trade and it's just, you know, somewhere along the way, this just wasn't a good fit personality wise. Clearly, I think Hassan Reddick massively overvalued what the league thought of him because I don't think anybody was willing to pay him what he wanted. So now you're at a stage where if you can go and find a team that wants in, and maybe there is one out there like the Lions who just lost their their star defensive end, um, then maybe they can trade him for something. But at the end of the day, the the Jets could really use him. Their defensive line has been a disappointment and their pass rush has been disappointing outside of Will McDonald. So Getting him in the in the building would be good, but you know, is he a good teammate? Is he willing to come to the to the building without a huge raise? Like these are all questions that haven't really been answered yet. How unusual is it for the team to tell the player you go find a trade? Like usually that's not how things operate. Yeah. I mean, there's there's times where teams will like grant a guy permission to like look for a trade. And that's kind of what the Eagles did with him when he went to the Jets, ironically. So he's kind of in the same spot like six months later. But um yeah, you know, I, I just if he's dead set on getting a huge raise, there's not going to be any team that wants him. If he's comfortable going to a place where they're not going to give him a multi-year deal, maybe they throw in some incentives or whatever it is, then maybe they could figure something out. But um, I just don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a situation that has just gotten extremely ugly and it's kind of just been looming in the background. And now it came to a head right now as they're at their most chaotic point in the season where they change coaches and trade it for Devante and they're, lost three games in a row and all this stuff. So it's just another noisy item for the Jets. On one hand, like, you know, there's like crazy headlines about this team like every other day. And it does really seem like chaos. On the other hand, there, there are a lot of bad teams in the NFL. And most of them are not just like scrambling around and changing things and <laughs> going for it. Um, so I give the Jets credit there. At the same time, is this, should we see this as like a team in in chaos and flux and you know maybe it's all just going to collapse into a heap or do you say hey at least they're they're trying yeah you know i i think there's something to be said for the fact that you know woody's never woody johnson the jets owner has never fired a head coach in season and he did this to provide a spark and then he went out and traded for a guy to make it clear that they're all in on trying to win a lot of their a lot of decisions in his tenure have been pretty short-sighted and um you know to your point like is this chaotic and it's going to fall in their face or whatever. Like it's always chaotic around here and it kind of starts at the top. And, um, and so, you know, the best way to overcome that is by winning. And the jets haven't done a lot of that. And including this season, like there's these last three games, you could argue they should have won each of them for different reasons. And they kept shooting themselves in the foot, like the jets always do. So until, until the jets like show they're capable of overcoming these mistakes or, you know, winning these close games and there's no reason to believe they will. Right. And, you know, a close game, you can't really put that on the owner. But I'm yeah. wondering, I mean, 
there are owners in sports where the team is like never really um you just like an owner is sometimes something to overcome for the team and i'm wondering if you you put the jets in that category i think to a degree the owner is somebody to overcome he is somebody who invests in the team but i think there's been times where he's injected his opinion in spots where maybe he shouldn't or you know i don't know like i i i think he the last not this off season as much, but last off season and one before that, he let kind of Joe Douglas go all in on the off season, free agency, trade for Rogers, all this stuff. This off season, he kind of limited his budget a little bit until now when they went and got Devontae Adams. So I, I definitely think he's probably an owner that's more involved than like you know. The interesting thing about him is he wasn't here when Joe Douglas was hired, and he wasn't here when Robert Sala was hired because he was in Donald Trump's cabinet as the ambassador to the UK. And then he comes back, and he's two guys he didn't hire, and two guys that maybe thought that, you know, he was going to be more in the political realm than their day to day. And then he wound up being their day to day. And, you know, he, this is his business. And so it's hard to blame him for wanting to be involved, but I think sometimes you got to let your decision makers make the decisions. Yeah. That's, that's often how people feel with these owners who are, yeah. you know, ca causing trouble for a team or, or just, you know, a team that's unsettled and, you know, it always does start at the top. Um, and before we let you go, so, you know, we're, you know, still very ensconced in this Rogers era, the team's all in on this. Um, if, you know, it doesn't work out this season, doesn't work out next season, do they, do they just need to do a full reset and just, you know, be bad for a few years and, and try to build it back up? I mean, they pretty much won't have a choice. I mean, they, they've, they're kind of pot committed to Aaron Rodgers to the point where they're, you know, their roster, they're about this next off season, they're, their young players are eligible for extension. Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall. You're going to have to pay them. They don't have a lot of cap anyway. Aaron Rodgers is getting older. Like, so they, they don't have a lot of wiggle room to like make a huge splash. So if, if, if it flames out and they move on from Rodgers, whether it's after this year or next year, you kind of have no choice but to full reset. And maybe they can sneak in a young quarterback in next off season. You start to develop them or whatever it is. But ultimately, yeah, you know, if they're about to have a completely new coaching staff, if they don't make the playoffs this year, they, then you're starting from scratch there. And does Aaron Rodgers want that? Like, there's there's just so many unknowns going into next year. That's why they're so all in on this year because, you know, they don't really have a choice but to just focus on this year based on the construction of their team. Yeah. All right. Very interesting stuff. Zach Rosenblatt, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com fieldofgreens.com. While the Jets continue to double down on their time with Aaron Rodgers, another team that went in all in on a quarterback is going the opposite way. The one in five Cleveland Browns traded wide receiver Amari Cooper to the Bills. They're effectively giving up on this season, and at some point they may give up on Deshaun Watson. They'll have to eat the next two years of his contract, which they restructured into a cap hit of $73 million in each of those years. When this is all done, they will have given up three first round picks, three additional picks, and $230 million fully guaranteed for a quarterback accused of serial sexual assault. It's now playing at a mediocre level and being badly outplayed by Baker Mayfield, who the Browns tossed to the side to make room for Watson. This wasn't just a bad move. This set their franchise back years. And there's an inherent danger in putting all your eggs in one basket. But this whole thing felt wrong from day one. But don't expect the Browns to come out and say that because, as Cowboys owner Jerry Jones showed, being accountable is hard. In an interview with 105.3 The Fan, Jones was pressed on the team's struggles by hosts Shan Sheriff, RJ Choppy, and Bobby Belt. Basically, the hosts were probing Jones on team construction after they were demolished at home by the Lions 47-9. That's the team's worst home loss since Jones bought them in 1989. 
The Cowboys have struggled against good teams this year, but honestly, it's easy enough to get through interviews like this. You just say things like, that loss was a wake-up call, but we believe in the group we have, and our focus is 100% on winning the next game. Easy enough. Instead, Jones said this, quote, your job isn't to let me go over the reasons that I did something and I'm sorry that I did it. That's not your job, or I'll get somebody else to ask these questions. I'm not kidding. It's our understanding that Jones can't actually fire these radio hosts, but he does have a lot of influence at their station, and if he was truly not kidding, that this that could be a problem for those three. But I'm wondering what Jones thinks the job of the media is. If Jones thinks the questions he's getting are unfair or misguided, he can say that. But threatening media members who are not cheerleading for your team is him wanting to be a dictator of Cowboys world. If he's going to have a hissy fit when he gets some pretty obvious questions about this team, he probably just shouldn't do interviews. But threatening jobs of people less powerful than you is taking the low road. Over to MLB, the playoffs have delivered a huge ratings bounce back. After sagging viewership in last year's playoffs, the league has been gifted a semifinal series with both New York teams and L.A. Game one of the Mets-Dodgers series drew an average of 8.3 million viewers, which is the league's best league championship game one viewership since 2009. Prior to this round, the MLB playoffs averaged 3.3 million viewers, which is an 18% increase over last year's 2.8 million. A lot of this is luck, but it doesn't hurt that the Dodgers, Yankees, and Mets can afford superstars like Shohei Otani, Aaron Judge, and Francisco Lindor. Teams that don't give out payroll commitments equivalent to the GDP of a small island nation have a lot less room for error. Coming up, Atlanta Dream co-owner Renee Montgomery joins the show to talk about her journey from WNBA player to WNBA owner, as well as her thoughts on the growth of the league. We'll have that and more right after this. Very excited to be joined now by Atlanta Dream co-owner Renee Montgomery. Welcome, Renee. Let's go, Owen. Let's get it, baby. <laughs> Let's do it. So you're the subject of a new documentary on Roku called Radical Act, Renee Montgomery. You chose to sit out the 2020 WNBA season, ended up coming back as a player. You are, I believe, 33 at the time. Certainly had the ability to keep playing. Four years later, how do you look back on that decision? Yeah, four years later, I'm I'm thankful for just having a good unit around me because at that time it's like i didn't know obviously i didn't know all the different things that were going to happen and follow that but at that time i had like a one-track mind doing all right let me figure out what's going on and turn up with the city of atlanta and then i had no idea that the city of atlanta what they would end up giving back to me in a sense of just the community the support but it's it's crazy because as an athlete i mean you guys cover sports and athletes all the time but as an athlete it's like getting to the WNBA is, was an unlikely scenario in the first place. So I was very stressed about having like done all of this work to get to this pinnacle of my life and playing at the highest level just to kind of stop. And, you know, anybody that knows in sports, it's like stopping is the last thing you want to do. You want to keep your body going. You want to keep that motion going. But it was just one of those things where, Stopping felt like the right decision, even though it felt crazy to think that stopping was the right decision at that time. Yeah, and, and that time was a crazy time in the world. Was it because of all that, basically, that, um, that, that you made that decision? I mean, that was the only reason, you know, like logic would tell me to go play in the wobble and logic would tell me to just, you know, you can do both. Because a lot of people, I think it's great that there were so many athletes that that had their their own moments and their own momentum in their way, like whether it was after a big game in a press conference, whether it was taking a knee, which you saw a lot of leagues doing. It was, but there was only one reason that I sat out. It was like, first of all, I have a dad, a son, nephews. And when you see tragedy happen like that, the first thing we all think is like, oh my gosh, I'm so thankful to still have my family members and to still be able to to have a voice about something. So it kind of felt like a community endeavor in a sense of we all had to figure out something. And I don't, and I'm not even saying that something's figured out now, but it was just this energy where when you looked around, athletes were the loudest voices in the room. And that was very rare, especially that kind of broke the mold for the athlete having their own platform, the athlete having their own voice, because for a while there, you kind of didn't want to say anything that would rub your organization wrong, rub your your front office wrong. You know, athletes stayed in line to a certain extent. But after 2020, that was all that was over with. Like athletes, basically, they were empowered to just speak whatever they feel. 
Yeah, and I want to get to kind of how you see it now as as an owner of a team. But <laughs> you became an owner of a team because <clears throat> it was a very remarkable moment in in the sports world where you know in early 2021 basically the dream started protesting against their own owner kelly leffler you know that's not like like you just said you know players usually are not actively speaking out against their own leadership ownership you know gms etc um this was the exact opposite of that and uh, she ended up getting essentially pushed out as owner um and a new group came in that included you um again do you see that as just like this was a unique moment and this sort of thing is you know, not going to happen and maybe shouldn't happen when things are operating normally or um would you like to see more of that kind of situation it's interesting because like me it's it's crazy being an athlete and also in the ownership position because for a lot of times you feel like in negotiations you might feel like one group is negotiating against the other especially in terms of like cba and things but my brain is always in athlete mode because for 90% of my life, I've been an athlete. And just because I've become an owner in these past few years, I still have the same thought process. So I do like that athletes have their own platforms. Like I do like that they have their own podcast. You know, Haley Jones has the Sometimes I Hoop podcast. Angel Reese has Unapologetically Angel. You even see a Draymond Green where he'll do post game, literal almost press conference style on his own podcast that's wild you know like there used to only be yeah. one side of the story being told and it would be like you could i've known teammates where i'll see something printed and i'm like that's not really that's not really how it went down but there's not going to be any other rebuttal because what's going to happen is a player going to go do an, an expose interview with someone no of course not so then that one side of the story ends up being the whole story that's not really the case anymore. And for better or for worse, you know, because I do recognize that we could end up having a player that uses their platform and comes on and blasts us. But for me, I just think that like, we try to do things a certain way for the Atlanta dream. Business is business where there's gonna be like parts where you have to trade players. There's gonna be parts where people might get fired. But I hope that everyone that is a part of our organization understands that, you know, we try to go things, go about things the right way. So I like players being empowered to speak. Again, I know that we could end up being on the wrong side of it, but I hope that we kind of move a certain way that we don't. Yeah, I mean, on that, like being on the wrong side of it, it's, you know, it's often just an inherently adversarial relationship. Like when you're negotiating a contract, the ownership wants it to be a low number, the player wants it to be a high number, just like you, you have some, some very kind of straightforward incentives there. Um, did you have any moments as an owner of being like, oh, okay, like now I get it, you know, all these things oh, that like gosh. I hated as a player or thought like they were oppressing us or whatever. Um, now I, I see it from their side. Did you have moments like that? So many, oh, and even to this day, like, I mean, it's just like, because you don't know what you don't know. And as an athlete, I think it's almost like to equate it into to politics, it's like sometimes you might be mad at a pothole or mad about something and people are like yelling at the president for that. And it's like, don't you know that's your local government that you should be mad at? And so it's it's almost that type of thing where as a player, you're like, man, what's going on with our team? Our team doesn't do this. Our team doesn't do that. And then when you get to the other position, you're like, oh, we're not allowed to give gifts above this amount of money. Oh, we're not allowed to take care of our players this way. Oh, this is. So then you start to realize, oh, man, like we want to spoil our players probably more than what we're allowed to. But, you know, we got to follow the rules. And so that was a big like wake up call. I think even Larry in the documentary, he said, you know, his when we first became an ownership group, we were hyped. Like we were trying to change everything right away. And we understood that that's not going to happen that way. Um, but that's kind of was the thought process. We thought we were going to come in here and just switch it up. And then you realize very quickly that, oh, this is why some things are the way they are. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like the classic, like outsider story of like, you know, when you're outside, you can, you can dream big, you can, yeah. you know, you're not thinking of like the day-to-day -day budget and then you get in and it's, you know, you, you can still have those dreams, but you start to sort of realize why, you know, like your, your concerns get a lot more focused um, on, on, yeah, just like the day-to-day week-to-week stuff. And, uh, and, and so, you know, in what ways have you, you feel like you have done things differently and, um, you know, were able to maintain that new approach? Yeah. So I think we always just focus on ourselves. And so 
like for instance, even with the practice facility when I was playing, which again, 20, 20, 2019, we were practicing in like in the off season, we weren't, we didn't have facilities. So we were trying to find just different locations that I could even just train in the off season. So now being able to practice at core four and having the players somewhere they can train and also feeding players after practice. For me, um, that was like a huge, that's a huge thing for an athlete because I'm one of those athletes that after I go to, pro, I'm, I'm at practice early, then after I go to practice, I gotta get my shots up. After my shots are up, I gotta get in the cold tub. There's a whole routine about the way I wanna go about things to prepare my body and get it ready. But imagine if I'm worried about how to pack my lunch before practice or what am I gonna eat now that I'm starving? Those types of things can really affect your process. And so just we try to do things for our players that they have the best process possible where the food is right there after practice. So if you want to eat while you're in the cold tub or you want to eat before you get in the cold tub, go right ahead. You don't have to leave the gym now because you're starving, but you really wanted to go do some more stuff. That was a real plight that we had as, as WNBA players in, in some scenarios. And so we wanted to try to just make it seamless for our athletes. You want to be the best you. We want to make sure you got everything that you need to do that. Then it's on you. So I think that's kind of any athlete would take that um, option. And it just wasn't like that before. So those are things that like practical time, things that we're that we were doing to try to make sure what do you need? And we would ask the players and then we would try to provide what they needed. Let's go to some broader WNBA topics. Um, new media deal coming in next year, going to be about $200 million a year for the entire league. And then, you know, obviously that gets diluted when I mean, you spread it over all the teams and the league itself. What's it going to mean to the league to have this big new influx of cash coming in every year? Growth. I mean, growth is a beautiful thing, Owen. Um, I just think that this is this is a, a stepping stone because anybody that's been a part of this and been following the WNBA and women's sports, everybody, you kind of know what's coming. You know, like it's not like a it's, it's not a shocker if you say like women's sports is about to blow or women's sports is already going to blow. But if you said that five years ago, I don't know how many people would have invested in that thought process. I don't know how many companies would have invested in that thought process, media deals. But even still, I think that we're still at a point where that's a great start point. Because when you look at what's coming, I think Cheryl Miller had mentioned it, where if you look at what's coming into the WBA, we are not going to lack stars. The star power is just going to continue to grow. You got your Paige Beckers of the world, your Juju's of the world. The star power is going to keep going. So when you think about longevity of the WNBA, of course, saying it's 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 going to be a great investment is a dove factor for anybody that's in it. Now you talked about that outside world that you know you don't know what you don't know almost in the outside world. There's a lot of people that really are still probably don't believe it. They're probably like, women's sports is about to blow. Yeah, all right, maybe a couple teams, a couple. And it's like, that's that's the next step, I think. So the money is great. This is a good first step, but I'm loving to see all the brands. I'm loving to see the commercials on TV because all of that goes into building star power. If LeBron James was never on any ads and never on any commercials, would his star power be the same thing he is? You know, like that is what builds it. And so now I'm starting to see people's favorite WNBA players in commercials of football games, not just WNBA games, but football games, NBA games. That's that next step. And on that media deal, I believe the contract contemplates a potential uh, renegotiation. Do you anticipate that deal will be renegotiated at some point along the line? I anticipate that it's going to get interesting. Like, you know, I just think that this is a time, you know, like I, I honestly don't know what what's going to happen. But I just do know that this is one of those moments where something's going to happen, even in a sense of major growth, like even this year, getting private flights for WNBA players, that's before the CBA. That was a big step, because when you think about it, that could have been a negotiating piece that was used, but the league chose to do the, the right thing and allow the players for safety reasons, for recovery reasons, for all the reasons brought in chartered flights a year before a negotiation. So I don't know. I just feel like with so many things happening and changing right now, you can just expect it to get interesting. I mean, we got the expansion draft coming up, which we haven't had one of those, I think, since the Atlanta dream, which is which is crazy. So there's a there's a lot going on in the WNBA that I just think the fans, this is a time now 
like for fandom to grab a hold. It's like there's new fans, there's old fans trying to to plant their flag. Like I've been here, there's new fans. Like we're here now. I'm loving it. Like I think that this is exactly what we needed. On expansion, so we've got three new teams coming in over the next couple of years. Uh, there's probably going to be one more by, I think, 2027. Um any particular markets that you think the league should be taking a, a very close look at? It's tough because I actually asked, I asked Ruthie Bolton Holyfield this on WNBA Weekly, and she gave me an interesting answer that I haven't seen, like just tossed around because we already know which ones are coming. But I thought she said New Orleans. And I was like, that's, that, that's exactly what I was like. I haven't heard many people talking about that location, um, but they are very much so sports driven. Their fans are, you know, I'm a Falcons fan, so I'm not the ain'ts are the ain'ts. They are what they are. But I'm just saying, like, you just can see that their fandom is strong there. Like they go hard for their team. And even when you think about LSU and that fandom there. So I, I thought that was an interesting answer from Ruthie uh, on where would she like to see a, a place to go? Yeah, I mean, the LSU connection is, I hadn't thought about that, but that, that is an interesting thing. There's still so many open markets right now. There's, you know, yeah. a lot that, that make a lot of sense. Um, before we let you go, just in um, getting back to the documentary, what do you think people will get from just hearing your story and this this very unique journey you've been on? And I hope, you know, shouts to Sandrine, our director, because the way she put the film together you know, she talked about how she wanted to show conflict resolution, conflict resolution. And so I think the, the main thing that I want people to just take from it is the concept that like you are your thoughts. You know, like I for I was in environments sometimes that like, well, there's these are I grew up in West Virginia. So it's not necessarily the biggest, most supportive hub for a player like me. But then I had my family and then I had this nucleus around me. But also I had my thoughts and I believe things that people didn't believe about me. Like if I'm saying I'm going to go to a D1 school and people are like laughing, I don't really care because I had these own my own thoughts. And at every turn of my life, it was that same scenario. Even there's a part in the documentary where Coach Ariema was like, you know, I just kept throwing stuff at her and I just kept throwing stuff at her. And for me, I just don't care what problems come like I'm only solution based and I try to like just stay focused on what the goal is and the positive angle. And I think a lot of times like people get caught in the negativity, you know, even on social media, you can get caught up where you'll see celebrities, they don't like, there'll be a person that sends 10,000 nice tweets to them and then sends the one tweet that cusses them out. And you know, that's probably the one that they're honestly gonna respond to. That's it's just shifting that mindset to where every morning, you know, I tell everybody, good morning, fam, good morning, good people. And I try to gravitate towards all the positive things in life because it is easy to let a negative article, a negative human or a negative interaction kind of suck you into this world of doubt. Um, I just kind of live life where I stay in the light and I just focus on whatever a solution is. That's where I'm at. Uh, I think in sports, we always say control your controllables. And it always sounds good, you know, but it really is true. It's hard to, I'm not saying it's easy. I've trained myself to do that over time because in sports, you've got to have tough skin. But I think just with the documentary, I think I hope people understand that a radical act is really just believing in yourself when, when maybe the world doesn't believe it. Maybe your family does and you do, and that's all you need. Uh, I think it's a great note to leave it on. Renee Montgomery, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I appreciate you, Owen. The NFL owners meetings are underway right now, and Tom Brady has been approved as a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. My colleague Eric Fisher is on the scene in Atlanta. He gives us the inside scoop on everything coming out of those meetings, and that's up next. I am joined now live from Atlanta at the NFL owners meeting by Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you on. Um, so, bunch of stories out of these owners' meetings. Uh, let's start with with the goat. Tom Brady has been approved yes. as the owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, so, uh, let's get your initial reaction here. So, he's coming in as a part owner. He's personally going to have about five percent of the team equity, and then as a larger consortium with former teammate Richard Seymour and his uh, business partner Tom Wagner, they're collectively going to have about ten percent of the team. And, you know, we've seen other former players come in as team owners. And you think about people in, a, in other sports, you know, an Alex Rodriguez or a Magic Johnson. There's plenty of examples out there. But 
Tom Brady's at a different level. And even though Mark Davis is still going to be the control owner of the Raiders, again, this is the GOAT that we're talking about here. And this just kind of hits at a different level. Yeah, and I saw that Mark Davis, I guess, told reporters, told someone that um, Brady is not going to be the quarterback for the Raiders, but he can help them select quarterbacks going forward, uh, which is an interesting statement just because, um, you know, I think some people, when this whole all started, it felt like Brady just, you know, he's joining the club, but he's not going to be running the team. Sounds like he'll have some influence. Yeah, so there are a whole bunch of rules that are put in as part of this transaction, and which was also complicated by his role as the lead NFL analyst on Fox Sports. But as one of the rules is that he can't do another comeback. If he's a team owner, then he's a team owner. He can't be a player and owner at the same time. So that was one of the rules. As it stands now, there's not a defined role in football operations for him. It's not like he's a general manager or the president of football operations or something like that. But again, this is Tom Brady we're talking about and one of the great minds in NFL history. Why would you not tap into that in some meaningful way? And that's certainly going to happen. And as the weeks and months evolve here, that meaningful way is going to be further defined. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, We also had uh, actually a larger minority sale of a team approved. The Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gores is buying 27%, I believe, of the Chargers. Um, buying yep. out DeSpinos for Barian. Uh, what's, uh, what's the story for you here? So a couple of different levels. On one level, there was some infighting within the Spanos family. The, uh, the selling party is a sister of Dean Spanos. Um, and so this sort of helps resolve some interfamily, interfamily issues. Um, but then also you're bringing in somebody who's accomplished in sports elsewhere and is also uh, accomplished in the world of finance and private equity. This is a more conventional LP stake sale as opposed to a private equity deal. But at the same time, Tom Quartz is somebody with his own acumen and his own extensive track record. And so, again, bringing somebody of significant accomplishment into the NFL ownership lodge and and in a somewhat similar way, like we're talking about Tom Brady, this is just bringing in more people of impressive stature. Yeah. And from 27%, it's easy enough to imagine one day getting to at least 51. Um, uh, another story Maybe out of the right meeting. Is, oh, yeah. It looks like the Spanos family wants to retain control for now, but you know, again, things change and you never know. And, and as you correctly point out, a good way to become a majority team owner in the NFL is to start as a minority team owner. Yeah. Um, let's hop over to Jacksonville. So the, yep. the team has a, their new stadium deal was approved. Um, this has been something of a saga and it's very much not over. Uh, give us the basics here. So there was a $1.4 billion deal to renovate Everbank stadium. There was a, Uh, agreement between the local politicians and the team Uh, close to a 50 50 split. There's a little bit more on the taxpayer side, about 775 million of public money coming in to renovate the stadium because there's some G three money involved. And because uh, all these kind of stadium construction, stadium renovation deals have to be sort of blessed generally to make sure that they're sort of not, aberrant to overall league policy this came through the usual approval flow and it was unanimously approved and everybody sort of feels like this is a good thing you've got a nearly 30 year old facility that's going to get a dramatic facelift uh roger goodell said it's like you can't even call it a renovation given how extensive the contemplated work is and this should put Jacksonville well in line for major events, maybe a Super Bowl down the road, um, you know, certainly thing, other things like a college football playoff, that kind of thing. And, and it's it's a big deal for that community. And I understand the Jaguars are they're going to have to play somewhere else for a little while. Um, do we know anything new about that? That there's deliberation still going. This is not a new thing because obviously this project has been out there and contemplated for some time. And again, given the scale of the renovation and what I just said in terms of you can't even really call it a renovation, given how extensive this is going to be, there's going to be essentially a year, maybe a year plus 
where they're going to have to be elsewhere. And they're looking at a variety of options and certainly nearby things like uh, the University of Florida and those kinds of things um, are on the table. Orlando is another option. Um, and they're still kicking that around and we're, we're not there yet. Um, London, where they already play some games, that certainly could be part of the mix as well. And it's probably going to be some combination thereof in terms of London and college facilities. Um, Tampa, probably a more of a far out sort of thing. I Playing in somebody else's stadium that's in the league, that's more complicated. Um, but I would imagine ultimately once we get to an answer, some mix of you know, those kind of college facilities in the area in London. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see uh, how much London is a factor here, given that the Jaguars are regularly playing two games a year there already. Um, let's stay in Florida for a sec. Uh, Dolphins private equity sale is, has not happened, but I understand you, you spoke with some team execs there. Yeah. So I had a conversation with the uh, team president earlier today and he, like a lot of other teams, are still kicking the tires on a number of deals that basically everybody has called everybody in some fashion and talked to everybody ever since the end of August when this program was officially blessed and put into place. And we're going to see some deals by the end of the year. There's a variety of tax-related reasons and such where there's a, a bit of a calendar impetus to perhaps get some of this done. We're not officially over the finish line yet on any of these. Again, today was in part about some of these other more conventional, traditional LP uh, transactions. Um, but we're going to see some private equity activity officially by the end of the year. There's another league meeting in Texas in December, uh, close to the holidays. And at that one, we could very well see something actually being put up for a formal approval vote. And just to wrap us up here, uh, just one more story. The, um, we have another Super Bowl host. So in 2028, the big game will be coming to Atlanta. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, so the next three Super Bowls, including the upcoming one in New Orleans, were already spoken for in terms of hosting. This was the next available one on the line. Um, and there'll be a nine-year gap between the, that 2028 game and when Atlanta last hosted in 2019. But really, the bigger story and, and what we wrote um, is just the real emergences of Atlanta as a big time sports town that over the next handful of years, you've got a CFP title game. You've got the Major League Baseball All-Star game, part of the FIFA Club World Cup, part of the actual Men's World Cup. You've got this next Super Bowl coming up. And then a few years further down the line after that, you've got a Final Four. This city has really, really come on as a as a global center for big time sports events in a really, really big, big way. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The public, the teams, uh, the local sports commission and the local politicians all work very well together and really have put their uh, collective foot forward. And then there's just a lot of cool stuff happening downtown in terms of further development. It's a very approachable, walkable downtown that's sort of come a long way. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, there's a good amount of availability in terms of hotels and uh, in-demand restaurants. You've got the busiest airport in the world. And so there's just a ton happening there in Atlanta. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you get back to that, that big city. But Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah. Sp speaking of that world's busiest airport, I'll be heading there soon. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. After two straight seasons away from the court, Lonzo Ball is finally making his return with the Bulls in tonight's preseason game against the Timberwolves. That's 1,006 days since Ball has seen game action. If Ball's return goes according to plan and he becomes a regular player for the Bulls again, he'll become the first player in NBA history to ever come back from meniscus and cartilage replacements. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you're subscribed on the platform of your choice and tell a friend. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.